Hello, this is Lecture 6b, the second lecture for our Week 6 module on experimental methods used in immunology research. Today we will talk about antibodies, which are a very widely used tool that form the basis of many types of methods, or assays, that are used in research. We will start by talking about how antibodies for research applications are generated, the different types of antibodies that you can make and use for experiments, and lastly go over several common lab assays that make use of antibodies. At this point in the course, you know a lot about the structure and generation of antibodies during the humoral phases of an immune response. So with this information in mind, learning how we make antibodies for research applications is going to be super easy for you to understand. So first, you purify a protein of interest that is the cognate antigen for the specificity of antibody that you would like to make. So for this hypothetical example, say that you want to make antibodies that recognize IL-1 beta or murine IL-1 beta, shown here in yellow, which means that it's IL-1 beta that came from a mouse. And you should remember what this cytokine is from our earlier lectures on innate immunity because it's produced during uh, pyroptosis and downstream of inflammasome activation. To make antibodies mounted against murine IL-1 beta, you inject this cytokine into a different species of host animal who will not be immunologically tolerant to this protein. And this species difference means that the host animal will react to the antigen of interest as a foreign protein and treat it the way it would respond to an infection, even though obviously the protein itself isn't infectious. As a side note, sometimes you can do these experiments by administering something called an adjuvant at the same time as the target antigen, which could be any of a number of different things that all function by stimulating innate immunity to boost inflammatory responses along with the antigen. And this is called boosting the immunogenicity of the antigen. Also note that in this example, we're using a rabbit as a host animal, but many different animal species can be used for antibody generation, including goats, donkeys, mice, and hamsters. So since this host species mounts an immune response against foreign antigen, it undergoes B cell activation and the induction of a humoral immune response that we learned about during week five. These responses consist of multiple B cell clones whose distinct specificities recognize different epitopes or smaller protein motifs that are present on different parts of the antigen's tertiary protein structure. This is referred to as a polyclonal B cell response, where poly means many and obviously clonal refers to B cell clones. Each of these clones will become activated, proliferate, and undergo processes required for antibody secretion, which we've already learned about. Now, after about two weeks following immunization, thanks to its humoral immune response, the host animal now has polyclonal antibodies circulating in its blood. At this point, you can collect blood from this host animal and then separate out the serum, which contains all of the circulating antibodies. And serum is just the fluid phase of whole blood after it's been allowed to clot. And in this case, since the serum contains antibodies, this is uh, commonly referred to as anti-serum. Again, this is a polyclonal mixture of antibodies, all of which recognize murine IL-1 beta, but do so by binding to different epitopes on the same antigen. To help clarify this point, this diagram from the textbook shows how one antibody clone in blue binds to a blue epitope residues present at the top of the molecule, while one antibody clone in red binds to red epitope residues at the bottom of the molecule. Therefore, polyclonal antibodies share the same overall specificity for an antigen, but they do this by recognizing different epitopes on the surface of the antigen. And I just wanted to clarify this before we move on to the next section. Now, the antibody pool that we get from this experiment has a general naming convention that we should go over quickly. It's called polyclonal rabbit anti-mouse IL-1 beta, which sounds like a lot, but we can break it down in a way that makes sense. So polyclonal obviously refers to the clonality of the antibody pool. Um, rabbit refers to the host species that was used to immunize against our target, IL-1 beta. The alpha symbol just stands for anti. Here, this generally just signifies that it's an antibody. This is listed as anti-mouse IL-1 beta because the specificity of the antibody is for mouse IL-1 beta. So if we had used a goat as our immunization species, then we would call this pool polyclonal goat anti-mouse IL-1 beta. If we had used a donkey, it would be polyclonal donkey anti-mouse IL-1 beta, etc. This polyclonal pool is fine to use for several antibody applications, but there are a couple of things that we might want to address before deciding to use this target IL-1 beta um, in any of a number of different study techniques. And the first is that the overall amount of protein that you isolate from circulating serum of an immunized animal might not be very high. And even if you purify and concentrate the antibodies, 
This might not be the most efficient way to generate large quantities of antibody. And this is particularly important for clinical applications where you might need high doses of antibodies for things like immunotherapy treatments. The second point is that for lots of clinical and research applications, you want to use antibodies that all bind to the same epitope on your target antigen. And we'll get into this in a little bit. So you don't want to have the antigen coated with all sorts of different antibody clones binding to all sorts of different epitopes on that uh, protein. In this case, you would want to have a vial of antibodies that all have the exact same epitope specificity, meaning that they were all produced by the same B-cell clone. And the name for this would then be a monoclonal antibody. Monoclonal antibodies can be generated by making something called a hybridoma, which is then grown in tissue culture and can secrete large quantities of immunoglobulin with the same variable region specificity. Hybridomas are made by immunizing a host animal, as we've already outlined, then isolating a plasma cells from the spleen of an immunized animal. And those plasma cells are then mixed with an immortal cancer cell line called a myeloma under culture conditions where the plasma cells will fuse with the myeloma, <laughs> sorry, fuse with the myeloma cells to create B-cell hybridoma cells that are both immortal and will secrete antibodies. So they have properties of the myeloma as well as the plasma cells. These hybridomas can then be grown in media that selects for fused uh, B-cell myeloma hybridomas, so you can get rid of any single cells. And then you can separate out each of these into single cell clones. And culturing the single cells will make them proliferate, generating a pure population of daughter cells that all generate the same antibody specificity. And these are referred to as the individual antibody clones. The hybridoma is an immortalized transformed cell that proliferates rapidly while making large amounts of monoclonal antibodies and can be used for long-term cell culture in order to generate large quantities of monoclonal antibodies in vitro. You can use polyclonal antibodies or monoclonal antibodies for different experimental methods, but before we learn more about these methods, I just want to make sure we're on the same page regarding how these different forms of antibodies are made. The first method we'll cover is something called immunoprecipitation, or IP, where a monoclonal antibody that is specific for a protein of interest is conjugated to inert beads. And this allows for the isolation of antibody antigen complexes or antibody protein complexes from a sample containing a mixture of many proteins. In this example, all cells in a given sample have been pulsed with a radioactive isotope that is then incorporated into all of its proteins, therefore labeling them. So all the proteins in the cell contain radioactive isotopes. These cells are then broken open or lysed in a detergent that dissociates the plasma membrane and allows all of the intracellular proteins to go into solution. Antibodies whose FC regions are bound to tiny beads are then incubated with this mixture to allow cognate antigen binding. After incubation, all unbound proteins from the cell samples which haven't interacted with the antibody are washed away, and then the cognate antigens are eluded off of the antibodies using another type of detergent. The previously bound antigens can then be separated out by size using something called gel electrophoresis, where a charge is applied to a sample that's been loaded onto a lane of a polyacrylamide gel, and proteins then migrate towards the positive end of the gel, with smaller proteins moving faster through the gel um, so they get to the bottom uh, quicker, and so larger proteins are at the top of the gel. Because all cellular proteins have been radio-labeled, you can then image the size-separated proteins on the gel using X-ray sensitive film, and this visualizes bands of eluted protein. These bands can be compared to a molecular weight standard that was run on the same gel, which allows you to then estimate the molecular weight of bound proteins that were pulled down by your antibody. IP lets you characterize some qualities of the target antigen in a given cell sample. And this is done primarily by seeing if the molecular weight of a protein of interest has been changed following an experimental treatment, such as something that would have affected this protein's intracellular processing. IP is also used as the basis for a related technique called co-immunoprecipitation or co-IP, which lets you test if one protein of interest is physically interacting with a second protein of interest. Antibodies can also be conjugated to a tiny bead called biotin, and we call these biotinylated antibodies. These can then be mixed with magnetic beads and together be used to isolate a cell population of interest based on expression of an antigen that is only expressed by that cell population. You can use monoclonal or polyclonal antibodies for this since there's no need to be super picky about the specific epitope that's used on a marker of interest. You're just trying to isolate a cell population as a whole.
Now, to do this, you take a sample of mixed cells in suspension, usually ones isolated from mouse tissues since these contain a mixture of many different cell types, and incubate it with a biotinylated antibody that recognizes an antigen expressed on your cell type of interest. And this is also mixed with magnetic beads that will stick to biotin. In this example, we're using CD11C, which is an integrin expressed primarily on dendritic cells. Incubating the cell mixture with biotinylated anti-CD11C leads to what is essentially magnetic labeling of all the dendritic cells in that sample. You then pour the sample over a column that usually contains some sort of fiber or sponge matrix to stop the liquid from just dropping through the column right away. This column is placed in a special type of magnetic stand, which functions by firmly holding any magnetically labeled cells in the column matrix, while unlabeled cells in the mixture will flow through and be discarded. The target cell population can then be obtained by removing the column from the magnet stand, and this allows your isolated dendritic cell population to flow through the column and into a fresh tube for collection. And this is called positive magnetic selection. There are also negative selection strategies for cell isolation that follow the same principles here, but do it in the converse way, where you would label every cell type that you don't want, and this means that the first round of flow through contains your target cell population, while everything that you don't want is held in the magnet stand. This can be helpful if you're trying to isolate cells that might become activated in response to antibody binding, in which case you don't want to label them with biotinylated antibodies. A second type of assay is called an enzyme-linked immunosorbents assay, or ELISA. The example we will discuss today is a sandwich ELISA, which functions by using two different monoclonal antibodies that recognize two different epitopes on that same target antigen. One of these is called a primary capture antibody, which is bound to the surface of a plate well, and the second is a secondary detection antibody, whose FC region is covalently linked to an enzyme. Now, when antigen is present, it forms kind of an antibody sandwich with each monoclonal antibody on either side of the antigen. A substrate can then be added to the sandwich, which will be converted by the linked enzyme into some sort of signal for the assay. In ELISA's, this is usually the generation of a colored protein or fluorochrome. So these are called fluorometric assays or colorimetric assays. Therefore, the secondary antibody's enzymatic activity through substrate conversion is used as a readout for the presence of antigen, and the intensity of color generated uh, correlates with increased densities of antigen. To do a sandwich ELISA, you start out by coating a plate, uh, a plate well with the capture antibody, which is bound to the plastic at the FC region with its antigen binding domains sticking out into the well. You can then add a sample that you want to analyze for the concentration of your antigen of interest, and this could be something like a lysate from animal tissues or culture media that was taken off of a cell culture sample that received experimental treatments. If antigen is present in the sample, it will bind to or be captured by the capture antibody. You then add the enzyme-conjugated secondary antibody, which again must be a different antibody clone for the same antigen in order to be able to bind to a different epitope of the antigen than the capture antibody. Once this is added and you've formed an antibody sandwich, if antigen is present in the sample, you then incubate the sample with some of the enzyme substrate. And again, if antigen is present, then the linked enzyme will catalyze a reaction with its substrate. With ELISA's, this enzymatic reaction usually yields a colored product that is read out as a signal for the presence of antigen. And again, the intensity of the color present in a plate well can be quantified using an instrument called a plate reader. The intensity of the color generated is directly correlated with increased densities of antigen in the experimental sample. And you can calculate the concentration of the target protein in a given sample by comparing its intensity value to those that are established by a standard curve that you run in the same plate. This is made by running the assay on protein standards of known concentrations. ELISAs are often used to quantify concentrations of soluble factors in a sample, like cytokines or chemokines. There are a few different types of ELISAs, but they all work through the same principle of using some form of linked enzymatic activity as a readout for the presence of antigen. A third type of antibody assay called a Western blot also uses primary and secondary antibodies to detect the presence of target proteins in a given sample, although the logic here is a bit different compared to the sandwich ELISA. In a Western blot, the primary antibody is again specific for antigen or target protein of interest. However, instead of being specific for a different epitope on that same antigen, Westerns are done using secondary antibodies that recognize the FC region of the primary antibody that was used in this assay.
The secondary antibody is still linked to an enzyme whose substrate catalysis can be used as a readout for the presence of antigen um, that was detected by the primary antibody. So this logic is the same between ELISA's and Western's, but the specificity of the secondary antibody is different for Western blots. Because the primary and secondary do not recognize the same antigen, it's okay to use either monoclonal or polyclonal antibodies for this protocol. For Westerns, you start by loading a sample, which is usually a lysate taken from cells or animal tissues, onto a polyacrylamide gel, and then you run gel electrophoresis like we saw for the immunoprecipitation protocol. Again, because these samples include a mixture of proteins, gel electrophoresis allows for the separation of proteins based on their size, with smaller proteins moving more quickly towards the bottom of the gel, while larger proteins migrate slowly and are closer to the top. This allows you to separate your target antigen, sh here shown as uh, purple dots, from other differently sized proteins. Once the sample has been separated by size, you then lay the gel over a fixed membrane and transfer the size-separated proteins from the gel onto this membrane. Again, this is done by applying an electric charge. Once the proteins are fixed onto a membrane, you then probe the membrane for your antigen of interest. So first, the primary antibody with specificity to your target of interest is added, and then after that incubation, you add the enzyme-linked secondary antibody that is specific for the FC region of the primary antibody. Like with the ELISA that we just learned about, you then add a substrate for the linked enzyme that will catalyze a reaction yielding a signal that can be detected as a readout for the presence of antigen. There are a few different types of these for Westerns, but maybe the most common substrate is a chemical that is catalyzed into something that emits light or luminesces. So this is referred to as a chemiluminescent assay. This luminescence can be detected by laying the membrane over a piece of film and then developing that film in a darkroom. So if your antigen or protein of interest was present in a sample, then you end up with dark bands on the film where light was emitted, with thicker bands or blobs uh, sometimes corresponding to higher amounts of target antigen that were present in the sample. You compare the location of these bands to a protein standard in order to make sure that your target protein turns up in the place where you would expect it to given its molecular weight. This example here in the upper right is a western blot that I ran back in grad school where I wanted to detect the pro-apoptotic protein caspase 8 in a few different cell lines. So you can see that the antigen, caspase 8, was present in samples 1, 2, and 3 but absent in sample number 4. And the beta actin row below is something called a loading control, which just makes sure that you loaded the same amount of overall protein into each well of your gel. Western blotting is an easy way to check for the presence or absence of proteins, and to a lesser extent, the relative amount of protein. However, Westerns aren't quite as quantitative as some other antibody-based methods for measuring protein concentrations in a sample, so just keep that in mind. A fourth application of antibodies also involves antibodies whose FC region is covalently linked to a molecule that's used as a readout for antigen expression. These are often used in immunofluorescence or IF microscopy, which is a type of imaging analysis that you can perform on either tissue sections or monolayers of cells that are cultured in vitro. And the simplest way to do this is by using antibodies specific for a target protein of interest that are directly conjugated to a fluorescent molecule called a fluorophore. Now, when the antibody is bound to target antigen, you place the sample under a microscope and apply a wavelength of light that is known to most efficiently excite that given fluorophore. And that's shown in this uh, diagram here in the left panel in blue. If you've taken some chemistry classes, you will remember that excitation of molecules means that their electrons temporarily increase their energy state. And when these excited electrons refer return back to their ground state, they emit energy as an emission wavelength. And this is represented by the green arrows in the right panel of this diagram. Excitation and emission wavelengths are well established for many different fluorophores, which means that an excitation laser can be paired with a detector that reads the corresponding emission wavelength of light for that given fluorophore. A microscope allows you to spatially map that emission to a specific location in the sample, which indicates that your target protein was present at that location. For abundantly expressed antigens, performing IF with directly conjugated antibodies can work for imaging by microscopy. However, if the expression of an antigen is low or you don't have a good antibody clone that doesn't bind super well, um, you may need to do sequential antibody incubations using a primary and secondary antibody like we just described for Western blotting. Except for microscopy, you would obviously use a secondary antibody that's conjugated to a fluorophore instead of an enzyme.
Because the FC region of a single primary antibody can be bound by multiple secondary antibodies, this effectively amplifies a fluorescent signal for a single antigen by increasing the amount of fluorophore molecules that are associated with a single antigen molecule. Whether you need to use a secondary antibody or, or a directly conjugated primary depends on a lot of factors like antigen expression levels and how good the antibody clone is. And usually figuring these things out takes a lot of optimization steps that are done by a researcher. Here is an example of immunofluorescent microscopy performed on a section of a lymph node dissected out of a mouse. And this image is from a talented coworker of mine, and her name is Yamar Farsakoglu. She stained this lymph node section with various combinations of either primary conjugated or secondary conjugated antibodies that were uh, specific for a marker called B220, which is shown in blue, and this is a marker for B cells, podoplanin in green, which is a marker for fibroblasts or structural stromal cells that are found in the lymph node, and CD8 in red, which obviously mar marks cytotoxic CD8 T cells. The fibroblasts in green provide a view of the overall shape and structure of the lymph node, and B220 staining really nicely shows the B cell follicles that are located along the outer cortex of the lymph node, and these again are shown in blue. You can see T cells concentrated in the deeper central region of the lymph node that makes up the T cell zone, and these again are in red. Immunofluorescence microscopy is a very powerful tool that can be used to show how certain cell types co-localize with each other, which would be the case if they're interacting with each other in response to an experimental treatment. And you can also use it to look at reporters of signaling activity in certain cell types by staining for antigens such as transcription factors. Flow cytometry is another really important tool that's based on the same principle of using an antibody fluorophore conjugate. Like with IF microscopy, this type of antibody provides an emission wavelength of that fluorophore as a readout for the presence of a target antigen on a given cell. So flow cytometry is powerful in that it allows you to measure more than just one or two readouts within the same sample. Because you are looking at individual markers, you usually use monoclonal antibodies for flow, but some polyclonal antibodies can work fine as well. So if you want to determine the composition and phenotype of individual cells within a mixed sample um, obtained by processing something like a mouse spleen, you can do this using flow cytometry. You would take your single cell suspension and incubate it with fluorophore conjugated antibodies to generate a stained sample of your single cell suspension. This is then run on a machine called a flow cytometer, which has a fluidics chamber that pulls cells through the cytometer one by one. And as each individual cell passes through certain points, they're hit with a laser beam that has the excitation wavelength of a given fluorophore. And in turn, a signal detector picks up the emission wavelength for that corresponding fluorophore. So therefore, the presence or absence of a given emission wavelength can be used to determine whether that individual cell expresses a target antigen. This is pretty simple when you're only looking at a single antigen, single fluorophore combination. But most flow cytometry experiments involve running large multi-parameter panels containing a dozen or more markers. We will discuss flow a bit more extensively next week when we talk about its applications in clinical diagnostics. The last example of antibody application that we'll cover today is a pretty major one used in both research settings as well as clinical settings. This involves direct binding to a surface antigen of a cell in order to either neutralize the activity of that antigen or to kill the antigen expressing cell. Let's look at the neutralization example first. And so here you have an antibody that's not conjugated to any other sort of readout molecule. And it recognizes a receptor expressed on the surface of a cell. Binding to this receptor may either change its conformation or block its interaction with other proteins in a way that interferes with this receptor's function. Therefore, inactivating the receptor and inhibiting any sort of downstream signaling. For this application, it's very important to use monoclonal antibodies since certain epitopes on a receptor may inactivate a receptor while others may, um, other epitope sites may activate it. So you wouldn't want to use a mixed polyclonal population here. A good example of receptor neutralization is through targeting IFNAR, which is the receptor for the inflammatory cytokines that make up type 1 interferons. And these are interferon alpha and interferon beta. IFNAR is made up of two subunits, IFNAR1 and IFNAR2. And when they are bound to a type 1 interferon molecule or a ligand, they transduce their signal using proteins from the JAK and STAT families to uh, lead to the expression of interferon-stimulated genes, or ISGs, which uh, have a lot of functions, but by and large, they work by promoting inflammation. 
If NAR signaling is advantageous during viral infections where you need inflammation, but there are a lot of patients that suffer from a collection of pathologies called interferonopathies. And these are characterized by high levels of interferon that are produced in the body even in the absence of any viral infection. And this can be due to various genetic or environmental factors. But this high level of interferon essentially will lead to autoimmunity where the immune system begins to attack its own healthy tissues. In these patients, we would want to inhibit IFNAR signaling in order to prevent autoimmune pathology. In this case, we can administer an antibody with specificity for either the ligand itself, such as interferon beta, or the receptor, which is IFNAR. This type of treatment essentially carries out the same neutralization functions that we learned about during our week five module, where we covered neutralizing antibodies that can bind to pathogens or toxins in order to interfere with their function. Antibodies are relatively large proteins, so binding to one of the IFNAR subunits at a certain epitope will likely prevent its dimerization and therefore prevent jak stat signaling, downstream ISG production, and inflammation that drives autoimmunity. This is a really important clinical application of monoclonal antibodies, and these types of treatments are often called immunotherapies, and we'll learn a bit more about a few of these in upcoming lectures. Another application of antibodies that's commonly used in research labs is called cell subset depletion. Here, the antibody functions by binding to a highly expressed surface antigen on the cell type that you want to deplete or get rid of. This coats the surface of the cell in antibodies and tags it for killing, therefore removing that target cell type. And this is usually done using monoclonal antibodies, again, to make sure that the antibody binds to an epitope that has been confirmed to lead to depletion rather than potentially activating a cell surface marker or receptor. Now, cells coated with antibodies using this method likely die through a combination of the mechanisms that we've learned about, including ADCC, opsonization, and phagocytosis, and uh, complement activation. The end result is that the targeted cell type is removed from the body. And this method is used in a lot of animal experiments where you want to eliminate a type of immune cell, such as CD8 T cells or CD4 T cells or whatever you're interested in getting rid of, um, to see if this affects your experimental readout. Um, and if it does, it would imply that the depleted cell subset plays a role in mediating whatever experimental readout you were looking at. Overall, in this lecture, we've learned about how the natural humoral immune response in lab animals can be used to generate antibodies with given antigen specificities, and that these antibodies can be used in a wide range of techniques that are extremely helpful for immunology research and clinical uh, research as well. Next week, we will extend this knowledge by learning more about some antibody-based tests that are used specifically in clinical diagnostics. We've established that antibodies generated in lab animals are polyclonal, which have numerous antigen epitope specificities, and that if we need to make antibodies that all share the same epitope specificity, these are called monoclonal antibodies, and these usually require the generation of something called a hybridoma. We've learned about several experimental methods that use either monoclonal or polyclonal antibodies, and the major experimental readouts that provide researchers with information using each one of these assays or techniques. I've summarized each of these primary readouts in the bullet points listed on this slide. That's it for this week's discussion of experimental applications of antibodies. There is one remaining lecture for week six, which will cover mouse models used for in vivo immunology research.